The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Pat Scott. Hey, Pat. Hi there. And uh, joining us for the first time is Patrick Mason. Hey, Patrick. Howdy, Dom. Uh, We'll introduce Patrick in a second, but before we do, I wanted to tell everyone about another show on the StarQuest Network they should check out once they're done here, which is The Secrets of Stargate, which you can find wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash stargate. Uh, right off the bat, I wanted to let everyone know that, um, you know, as this show goes out, you, you might be listening to this, you know, far in the future. But as the show publishes, we're not going to have another new episode for a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to be away for uh, a week and then I've got an event the following week. And just so, uh, so that just the calendar didn't work out. So we won't have a, a, um, an episode for a couple of weeks. You may have to wait a little bit to get my and Joanne's reactions to the the uh, Apple developer conference announcements and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure Father Corey is broken up about that, and <laughs> <laughs> he he has he has uh, good naturedly complained that he always somehow ends up on the Apple announcement episodes with me and Joanne, and he is just not a he's not a uh, iOS guy. Uh, so in any case, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with with uh, another new episode. Uh, but I did want to take a moment to welcome Patrick. Uh, Patrick, welcome to the show. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your tech interests and maybe something else you do here with us on StarQuest. <laughs> okay, well, I am a... Uh, I would put it that I, I am in charge of the people who do the real work at a power plant. Um, I've been in power most of my career. Um, I had a... I've, done some uh, side jogs and just some charity work uh, over the years. But for the most part, I've been all about making power. So kind of supporting the whole existence of technology. <laughs> it's been my game. We can't run it without it. <laughs> That's right. Um, and it, it's interesting when I got into it, we were uh, my first job was working at a nuclear power plant. I was a reactor engineer and I was brought on specifically because the uh, they had a guy coming up on retirement who ran their core monitoring software. And he was the SME and they were switching vendors from Ariva to GE. And I had previously worked for GE's advanced methods development group. So developing the nuclear codes that, that monitor the reactors. And so they're like, this guy, we'll bring him in to replace, <laughs> <laughs> replace Claude when he leaves. So that was, that was my first, my first stint was doing um, kind of software comparison uh, for reactor cores uh, and, and, Got to learn a, a programming slash OS that nobody uses anymore. VMS. <laughs> um, oh, I know. VMS. Yeah. 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 Was... Pat, did you did you program in VMS? No, but uh, yeah. uh, no, the uh, the um, uh, different people I know in in the computer organizations I, I shared pe- stuff with did. So. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, Pat, Patrick, um, I'm going to have to specify Patrick and Pat. OK, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Patrick, your work was let's just it's pretty low stakes compared to like Candy Crush. That is what you're saying, you know, yeah. nuclear. Yeah, reactor very low codes. stakes. No, yeah. okay. no problems could possibly come no about pressure. because uh, I got something wrong. <laughs> wow, Nothing can go wrong. Yes. <laughs> that's wild. Yes. So Patrick, yep. you also uh, help out on a couple other different shows. You're you're a panelist on several other shows with StarQuest. Uh, which other ones are you doing now? Uh, so I got my start on Secrets of Star Wars, and uh, I'm looking forward to the Acolyte coming out soon, so I'll be mm. coming back for that. And uh, Secrets of Middle Earth, which is uh, just a, a fantasy world I adore, so I'm very happy to be on that. And then um, I'm fortunate enough to be a regular panelist on Secrets of Movies and TV. Yep. Um, me and a, a couple of the other guys seem to have synced our nerdy interests enough that we just <laughs> oh another movie's coming out and the thing we like we'll we'll review that we always have another movie coming up so that's awesome yeah i mean yeah. speaking of speak, uh, secrets of middle earth the new season of rings of power is coming at the end of the summer and uh, uh i know uh a little inside information that there's some really interesting you guys are gonna have some interesting content on secrets of middle earth that people are going to want to check out so definitely subscribe to that so excellent yep. 
Awesome. Well, let's dive into today's episode. But for, before, as part of that, this is sort of leads into our main topic. I did want to share a tip for folks that I came across online, and it's a really good one uh, about being safe with your money online. And it's a new kind of scam that's out there. And th- the way it works is a stranger sends you money out of the blue on Venmo, Cash App, Zelle, you know, another app like that where, you, where people can send you money. And it's just like money and it lands your account out of the blue. And it's like, wow, hey, free money. Uh, now, a, a nice person will say, oh, whoops, you send this to the wrong person. And then, you know, you want to send it back. But don't. Go against your instinct to be a good person in this case. Just don't don't uh, deposit it in your bank account either. Leave it. Let it sit in the app because it's a scam. What they've done is they've used a stolen credit card to send you money. If you send the money back to them right away, what will happen is th- those are two separate transactions. So when the owner of the cre- stolen credit card disputes the charge, that charge will be that money will be wiped out from your account. Uh, the 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 money that has been falsely deposited there will be clawed back by the uh, the uh, credit card company. But if you've already sent the money to the person who sent it to you, that's their money. And now you're the one who's out whatever money they sent you. So I hope that's clear. So the first amount will get disputed at the credit card company and disappear from your account. But if you sent the scammer money from your nice valid bank account, that money won't come back. You'll be out that money. So just let it sit and wait for it to disappear because it should. If you want, you can even report it to the app. Like someone sent me this money and I didn't, I'm not expecting it. I don't know them. It was in error. You can say even, but don't do the oh free money or oh I'm so sorry here's your money back just let it stay so that's the uh, that's the tip so um, I haven't I haven't heard of anyone getting hit by this you know uh, personally uh, but I want to get it out there just so that people I don't hear of anybody I personally know getting hit by this let's put it that way yeah I've seen um, something similar on social media where people will create an impersonation account and then ask for money. Um, and then give a place to send it mm-hmm. and then um, you'll send it and then realize, Oh, that's not really the person, right? You'll get up with them later. Um, one of my coworkers had this happen and people, he was a nice guy. People really liked him. And so like they sent money to this unknown account. He was like, that's what, that wasn't me. Yep. And so, you know, and it was, it was not a huge, it was like 20 bucks or 40 bucks or something like that. But yeah, Years past, it was emails that did that, you know, oh, somebody's, mm-hmm. you know, stuck in London without money, et cetera. And I've had clients that lost four hundred dollars, you know, because they were trying to help their friend, you know, mm-hmm. yep. pastors. I hear all the times they, they're telling prisoners, we don't accept we're not looking for gift cards. We do not <laughs> need you to send us gift cards, uh, yeah. you know, or any like that. Just, you know, the pet past your, your priests are not asking for you to send them money. Cold heart, as Father Joseph always says, cold, hard cash. That's what Catholic priests want. Cold, hard cash. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I'll say as a as a charity runner, I've had uh, scammers do they'll drop. They'll do like 100 different fake email addresses and credit cards and they'll put five dollars as a deposit on each of those as a donation mm-hmm. and the, you know that they've done is they've stolen a hundred credit cards or whatever. And they're trying to, they're making deposits to see which ones will work yep. and some of them bounce back and some of them don't. And then eventually the, the clearing house, whoever it is, you know, uh, square or whoever says, Oh, these were all fake. And they come back and they, they take the money back from you. Right. We actually got hit by that a couple of months ago where there were hundreds of very small transactions from different cards, all with the same uh, business address, like hundreds of them, like, and so, uh, but luckily the system we use is was started blocking them the, the as fraudulent. It, it, it knows to look for that now, uh, but yeah. So just be safe, people. Be safe. And speaking of being safe, that's our primary topic tonight, which is uh, we're going to be talking about how to you know, more ways because we've talked about some ways already, but more ways to protect your security and your privacy while surfing online. And uh, one of the, the first ways we often talk about is VPNs, virtual private networks. And just to explain briefly again what a virtual private network is, is it's an encrypted tunnel between you and the Internet. 
you and you know where you're trying to go so that um when you're connected to a network like a wi-fi say uh there's traffic between you know your say your computer your laptop or your phone from your phone to the router and then from the the router then uh sends that information out to the internet to a uh, a server or something like that um but very often depending on who, who owns that router they can watch that traffic go by and if it's not if you ha- if you don't take extra steps they can see what that traffic is let's put it that way and a vpn is one of those steps it's not perfect it doesn't uh hide you know uh it, it it doesn't obscure what server you're going to. They can see what server you're going to, but they can't see the the uh, data that's going between your computer and theirs. Am I missing anything? Is that I means that's a pretty basic uh, explanation of a VPN. Yeah, I've p- heard people call it a tunnel. That basically your data is is protected by that tunnel, and nobody else can see it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like a subway car, like a subway tunnel, where, yes. your, where your information is on the train. Right. And right. it's not like subway tunnels are completely impervious. You can get into them um, if you really know what you're doing. But for you're going to limit the vast majority of people. So the average hacker who walks into Starbucks and jumps into their router because they haven't changed the password <laughs> yeah, from what it, the default was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they can just see everybody's traffic and they can worm their way into people's stuff it'll it'll keep somebody like that from getting into your into your stuff. It's it's like what they tell you with, you know, uh you securing your home, securing your car. It's not that you can you could make your home perfectly secure from anyone ever breaking in or your car from any, what you're trying to do is be more secure than the next guy and just make it that much harder for someone to break in. You want it to be, you know, so that, like you said, it, the, it's not the average skip, script kitty who's, you know, found some scripts online who can just read your traffic. You want to, you know, make sure you're hardened against people who are really want to get in there and the fact is is you're probably not that interesting to that sort of person they don't they don't need your data they're going after someone who's got much more interesting and valuable data than you do so uh in general you're just trying to make yourself more secure than uh than most and and that should 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 be good for you so uh, a lot of people have vpns there's a lot of different good VPN services out there. Uh, Pat, what do you use for VPN service? Uh, I use ExpressVPN. I did a study a couple years ago and ran Nord and a whole bunch of other ones through Ghost something, uh, Cyber Ghost, I think it was, uh, and, and tried about four or five of them separate trials and then decided that ExpressVPN, even though it was fairly expensive, it was faster and had more places that I could uh, find connection points than the other ones that I had tried. Some some of them, the penalty for for using it was like it was only 20 percent of the, the speed of without a VPN. And ExpressVPN was, was a lot better than that. I wasn't getting constantly knocked off, et cetera. So that's what I'm using currently. But there are s- several good ones out there. Just don't get the free ones. Right, right. And you actually make a good point. Too. When you use a VPN, you are going to have a bit a bit slower because it's going to be encoding, you know, encrypting and decrypting your traffic and that sort of thing, you know, in progress. So, you know, there is a slight penalty that you're going to pay and the better VPNs, the, the, that penalty is lower. Um, and you also make a, a, an excellent point, which uh, do not be tempted to use the free or ad supported VPN apps that you find in all the app stores. They are often just, tr- you know, traps, you know, they're just they're, they're phishing they're, they're, they're Your data is not being encrypted. They're reading it, the data or something along those lines. But they may hide it from other people, but they know it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you don't want to yeah. if you, you know, if you get what you pay for in this case. And so if you want to uh, uh, VPN, get one that costs something. Uh, although for me, I use encrypt dot me. Uh, I've used it for years. And I don't know if it's the best one, but I get it as part of a bundle with my Eero mesh uh, Wi-Fi, you know, for the home. Uh, I get an Eero Plus and the Plus, you know, for when I put, buy the Plus service, which is, I think, 90 bucks a year, I get free one password for my whole family, free encrypt.me. 
and a third thing which I don't use. I forget what it is, but it's a it's another thing that I didn't need. But um, so I use Encrypt.me, and it, and it, again, most of these will work across devices. So Android, iOS, Mac, PC, that's sort of Linux, that sort of thing. And most of them will allow multiples, you know, m- yeah. multiple machines that can uh, use it at the same time. So. Right, exactly. Patrick, do you have a VPN that you use regularly? Um, so if I have something I really am want a secure thing, I'll use Nord, um, the Nord mm-hmm. VPN. It's 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 basic. <laughs> it works. Yeah. Um, it's well reviewed. Yeah. You know? And th- that's the other part of it. Um a lot of times, though, I don't use VPNs so much for security reasons. I use them for privacy reasons mm-hmm. and for masking my location. Um, right. Or masking, yeah, and um, or my IP address. And so I don't, I, for those, I'll use, I'll use the free ones because I don't really care. Like, primarily <laughs> what I'm doing when I'm asking for um, locationality or for my IP address I'm doing it so that I can like watch the Canadian broadcast of the Olympics instead of the American one because NBC stinks <laughs> in my opinion. Right. I, I think the Canadians do a much better job. Um, or if I'm doing um, travel planning, uh, because a lot of times if you do a uh, quick refreshes like with Expedia or some of the other um, larger airline sites, they'll see that you're checking back and they'll notice that your IP address is the same, and they'll like, oh, we'll raise the prices just a little bit to ch- mm. create that fear factor, so you buy it faster. Oh, but nice. if you, if you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you mask uh, your yeah. uh, your IP, they can't do that to you. Um, yep. And then for privacy reasons, you know, if I don't feel like um, having the the ads constantly pop up, you know, with the mm-hmm. last two things I looked at on the internet or anything, if I'm like, ah, I don't feel, I don't want Big Brother to watch me quite as much. <laughs> uh, the other thing about uh, VPNs is the ability to to show that you're in another place yep. and uh, going and getting British movies or movie, British shows is nice. And I can pretend to be visiting London for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then this, so there is the, you know, getting British uh uh, you know, the BBC in America using the iPlayer. Uh, but there's also sometimes like when you travel and you like if you go overseas, you're a subscriber to, say, Disney Plus or Netflix. And they're going to tell you, oh, when you're in this country, you can't have, you know, you, people in that country can't have this service. Well, I'm paying for it. I want to have it. So you could do the, the location masking the opposite direction where you're, you're you, you tell it you're at home, you're in America uh, and you get access to your your stuff. Uh, there is so you could buy commercial VPNs. You can also run your own VPN in a, in a sense. Um, I use I I've recently gotten into a new uh, product called Tailscale, and it's kind of like a roll your own VPN. And let me explain what it is. So, um, it, rather than using somebody else's servers like the ones owned by Nord or ExpressVPN or whatever. Uh, it's peer to peer, which means that every mm. one of my devices is can be the server, can be the endpoint. So, for example, I have say I have uh, my computer on my desk at home and I go tra- uh, traveling. Uh, I can create a VPN, a tunnel through to my desktop Mac and go out to the Internet from here so that. I'm, uh, you know, my, it doesn't matter where I actually am. It looks like I'm at my desk as far as the internet is concerned, but it also means that all the devices connected that my network attached storage, my other computers, it, it appears that I'm on the same network and I can access all of my files and services the same as if I was literally present here, except I'm doing it over the internet and secure because it's a it's a encrypted uh, connection. So it's really p- pretty cool. Um, so y- it's a little more complicated than just a basic VPN. There's a p- few bits and pieces of configuring and you got to get your mind around it a little bit. But once you once you get into it, it r- works really well. So um, the benefits are it's private. You know, there's no one else. Th- there's no one else on that network at all. Um, it's secure. It's encrypted. Uh, there's no middleman. There's you know no 
your data is going directly from device to, to device, not over anybody else's servers. You can access it anywhere. Um, and, you know, people aren't able to, to steal your information. And it's scalable. You can just add, keep adding more devices to it. And you can add more endpoints, which is places where you're going out, you know, from to the Internet. So it's um, it's a really interesting solution. And um, uh, we d- I'm pretty sure that I am not paying anything for it. I think it's um, hillscale.com. There's like enterprise pricing. What is it? The starter. Uh, oh, there is like, oh, no, that's what it is. Uh, so it, it, you can get started for free. It's $6 per user per month. Um, but you're like, you're, it's your you the user. So you can have up to a hundred devices, uh, you know, for that $6 plus 10 devices per user. Uh, so, but, I, but that's, that's a, for business, I think actually for individuals, for personal, it's free. Yeah, that's what it is. It's for free for up to three users, um, uh, in a public domain, you know, in the, with a public, public domain. So, um, yeah, tail scale, it works pretty well. While we're on the topic of, of VPNs, I've been playing with another one that's called Surfshark. Mm-hmm. But the reason I got into it was uh, because I had some clients that were talking about privacy and they were talking about trying to get their data off of some of the data brokers. And so I was looking into a package called Incogni or Incogni, and there's something called Delete Me uh, out there also that will take you know, the information you give them and go remove them from data brokers like uh, all the search engines out there, the, all the search, people search type things. And so I tried the incogni, but what I found out was that it was cheaper to use that service if I got Surfshark as another VPN than it was to pay for incogni by itself. Mm-hmm. So I was playing with, you know, I, I played a little bit with Surfshark as well. Uh, but the 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 kind of the the companion is being able to get your data off of all of these places. And I have gone back now. I've, I've been on Incogni for about two weeks and I've gone back and looked at a lot of these search engines. I can't find myself on them anymore. Oh, good. So that that nice. is good. And in Kim Commando, who I know uh, several people have talked about, you know how good she is in, in recommending things. She recommends this service, and uh, basically, uh, there's there's a lot of information that you get spam and you get uh, you get on all these mailing lists and everything. That this takes them off, it, it, and it mm. reduces the amount of junk you get. So I wanted to bring that up as a kind of a companion. Yeah. We've talked about delete me before, but uh, this is, I think the first time talking about incogni. And when you talk about the, it's b- the better deal. Incogni is six, uh, six fifty a month when you buy it on the annual plan. Uh, it's 12 something when you just do it month to month. Uh, but Surfshark, they have a, a plan called Surfshark one, which includes incogni and, as well as other features uh, for and antivirus, six- a whole bunch of things, yeah. yeah. And that's two sixty nine a month uh, uh, when you buy a, tw- a twenty four month plan. Um, Three nineteen for when you buy it for the whole year. Uh, and it's sixteen bucks when it's month to month. So for Surfshark, you're probably better off just getting the uh, you know buying a whole year at once, that sort of thing. Uh, but you get Incogni and all that other stuff too. Uh, I, I like the idea. Like I've I've searched myself in some of these databases, and the I'm a little lucky in that. On the one hand, I have a very unusual name. It's not a very common name, uh, but I do share it with my dad and my nephew. So all of our uh, inf- all of the listings are are like a, 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 an amalgam of our individual information. <laughs> so and good luck to anyone trying to figure out who we really are when you when you when you look at that. So they'll send they'll target you all. <laughs> yeah, I I do get mail for, uh, addressed to my dad uh, in my house. Yeah, but I do I like this idea. I wonder how long like how long do you have to be on incognito? You know I mean like. After six months, do, do you still need it because they've removed you from all the databases or are, the, are these databases constantly re-adding you if you if you go off the service? Well, there's a service that's uh, part of uh, most of these data brokers that once you sign up and ask to be removed, they put you on a don't add back list. 
Right. So, so that it's not like, oh, I'm going to stop this. And all of a sudden they all come back. Most of them, the reputable ones will add you to this, this uh, suppress list. So you probably don't need incogni for very long then I would just expect. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And maybe after like two or three months there, you know, it's gone through all out of them. I think Delete Me actually targets more of the data brokers in terms of volume, like 700 or something. And Mm. I think Incogni does something like 300 or something. So, you know, you you still get uh, a lot of of mileage out of them. Right. I I would I would presume they continue to monitor them. That's probably the benefit yeah, yeah of staying that's with the basic thing yeah yeah make sure new new data brokers don't show up and start doing this yep yep uh so other you know advice for secure surfing um now this is less of a, of a deal now than it was a few years ago but you know make sure all of your web traffic is https for secure as opposed to the old http um so that what you what it, what that means is when you look in the address bar and you see the the domain name, uh, you should say https colon slash slash in the domain uh, instead of regular. But a, a few years ago, Google, I think primarily, but a bunch of the tech companies really pushed for you know the, the web browser companies really pushed for websites to all go secure. Like basically, Google said if you're not doing an have an ssl certificate which is what ensures that the the data that goes back and forth is encrypted um then we're you're going to get lower ranked in searches and that sort of thing and so all the websites went okay <laughs> so they they all got certificates and uh went https but if and if you do end up accidentally going to an http site the most browsers will now warn you that it's not secure. So the shame, uh, yes. Oh, yes. the shame of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you know it could be you could know the site is fine, whatever, and or you're not going to be doing anything on this site. That it's involves, information only, not yeah. not a uh, encryption. Yeah, right. The, but but nevertheless, um, you, it's better to have it than not. Um, the other thing, and we kind of mentioned this earlier. Uh, be cautious with public Wi-Fi like it's Starbucks or, you know, wherever you, you know, wherever you're out at a coffee shop. Always use a VPN in those places. If if you're on your phone to your carrier and not using the Wi-Fi, you're fine. A, you know, the, 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 the connection to your carrier is is much more secure. But if you're on a Wi-Fi network, use a VPN um, because, you know, you just like like you said, Patrick, you know, they the, the local Starbucks probably hasn't changed the default password on their Wi-Fi router. And it's and some guy sitting there in the corner, just slurping down everybody's data. <laughs> well, they, actually, sorry. Starbucks doesn't have a password. It's uh, the basically and they you connect to it and it says this is not secure. This you, you need to right. use a an encryption process. But, yeah, the, the little co- local coffee shops are posted on the wall and it's been that same thing for t- three years. Yeah. Right, right. Um. One thing to think about is, um, you a, a lot, your iPhone and your iPad even has a setting for auto join known networks, and what that means is like so when you when you um ha- when you've joined a, ne- a Wi Fi network in the past, where especially one where you've entered a password, it saves that and then um will automatically re attempt to rejoin. Well, no, that that's that's different. Um. The, the standard way of doing is is that it will rejoin those networks when you show up. You if you went to your brother's house and he has a Wi-Fi network and you've signed into his network, you will automatically be on his on the network again when you're there. That's fine. But there are other ones like public networks, like if you like Xfinity, if you're a Comcast customer and you have the Xfinity public Wi-Fi or Starbucks or McDonald's or whatever. Um, w- whenever you drive by these places your phone will try to connect to those Wi-Fi networks. Like when you're in close proximity to them, um, even though you've not been on that particular Wi-Fi network there, it will attempt to join any networks nearby, let me put it that way, that are, that are not um, secured. And while that's, that's, that's not a security problem, it's a power problem, you know, a, a battery problem in the sense of your phone is constantly trying to connect to Wi-Fi networks as you're driving around town. Uh, so 
it's best to try to turn, I think, to turn off auto join uh, public Wi-Fi networks so that you're not doing that. Um, just, I think just in general is a, is a, is a good practice. And as a, as a, as a flip to that, me and a bunch of uh, friends of ours. So we have like five or six families in the city that we, we regularly hang out with. We've all set up a secondary network on all of our routers that has the same name and same password on all of them. Oh. So when we go to each other's houses, our phones just automatically connect <laughs> to each other's routers. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's that, cool. That, it's like, it's like your own little pod, you know, your own yeah. Wi-Fi pod. <laughs> your clubhouse. That's right. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, so uh, another tip, check the privacy settings on your social media accounts on a regular basis. I have a reminder that comes up every six months to go in and Facebook, Twitter, X, Instagram. Uh, those are the ones I have uh, even you, but even like YouTube and others uh, go in and check the privacy settings, make sure they're the way you want it protecting. You know, I know there are like, for example, teachers or uh, other people who have public jobs who really keep their social media locked down because they don't want, say, students getting their phone number, or, you know, that sort of stuff, or even just be searchable by them. Make sure your privacy on social media is the way you want it to be and that you're, you're protecting your own privacy. Especially with Facebook, things like uh, at accident, actually connecting to apps that you didn't intend to, you know, maybe you looked at something, it it connected you to an app and you forget to go remove it. So mm -hmm. go look at all the pages you've joined. Go look at all of the apps that say that they're getting data from you, et cetera. Yes, right. right. You'd be surprised, actually, if you haven't looked at it in a while, go in there and see. I've got stuff. Not now, but I, I'm in the past. I've gone in like, wow, I haven't used that in about 10 years. Like that app, you know, that I gave permission to to have, you know, access to my profile. Like, I, I, There's nothing there. I'm, I'm too worried about in my profile, but I don't want you, like I don't want you to have that access in perpetuity. Like, nope, goodbye. I don't need you anymore. Uh, so, yeah, very good point. Yeah, and, and um, they're, the companies are always changing up their privacy settings. So whatever you set up six months ago may not be the same anymore because they've taken one setting and they've made it four. Exactly. And they may have defaulted one of those four to what you had, but the other three are to their default, which is always going to be, we want your information. Yeah, <laughs> and right. we're going to do what we want with it. Right. Uh, I find Facebook to be particularly, particularly insidious about that. Yes. Um, and Google to be particularly quietly insidious about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you you gotta watch out for that like the yeah the new privacy settings and then the new settings are less private that's the yeah. that's the thing yeah. Well, and the other thing is, is that there so many places have a sign in with Google or sign in with this or sign. Don't, you know, yeah. use your set up your own account with them because you can control it. If you're if you're signing in with Facebook for everything, guess who's got it? <laughs> right. And if someone gets control of your Facebook account, that they, they have control of that as well. And so you really got to be. Yeah, I, I tend to not do sign in with face. I don't absolutely don't do sign in with Facebook. Uh, no, thanks, Zuckerberg. Uh, I have <laughs> I still have some sign in with Google stuff because they were the first to do it. And it seemed really convenient at the time. Um, the one that oh, I yeah. sign in with Apple is is a little a lot safer. That's yeah. that's what I was going to say. The sign in with Apple one is the one I have. I, I, I generally do a lot. And uh, because right, because my Apple account is pretty darn secure. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned some Facebook scams. The grandma scams are that's what they call them. Um, social media posts designed to appeal to well-meaning older folks. Um, you know, look at these nice cookies that are that this person has baked. Oh, isn't it wonderful? I'm going to like it. I'll comment on how lovely it is. Uh, they don't really know the person. And then the person starts communicating back and creates a fake relationship and it develops into some way to scam them out of money, asking for money and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's, it's these cons that cultivate, you know, a relationship from people who are nice, just being nice people and uh, are not wary of the, the, the bad actors that are out there. So uh, the, the, the thing is, is most of the people listening to this podcast aren't, wouldn't fall for that, but you have people in your life who might, and that's that's the idea is you need to educate the people in your life about it. 
And it's the same with text messages where it says, oh, we're supposed to meet for tennis tomorrow. Are we still on, Judy and your mic? So it's it's the attempt to get you to start responding back. And then they cultivate a relationship. But it might take a month or two yep. before they start hitting you. I literally had one of those like minutes before we started uh, recording. Um, uh, you know, they're trying to something about their vet that for the dog. Hi, I've got the dogs and I'm, I'm worried about them, blah, blah, blah. And like, um, and I'm like, and I just I always just like wrong number. Cause I don't know if it's, if it's, it's literally such as a well-meaning person with the wrong number or not, or scammers. So I just, I, I used to have fun with them. And if it, if it's clearly a scammer, <laughs> I'll still have some yeah. fun with them. Yeah, but, yeah. um, but a lot of the times, especially when I'm busy, it's a wrong number. Um, Hey, Dr. Jason, I'm Kathy. I didn't dial the wrong number. This is the phone number you gave me the last time. Wrong number, not Dr. Jason. Huh? Aren't you Jason? Sorry, I have to check. Maybe I'm mistaken. Not Jason. <laughs> and then it's like, <laughs> I, I'm it's, and always they, they, they come to a point where they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I hope I have inconvenienced you and hope I'm not bothering you. Stop the conversation there because you've done your you, whatever diligence or duty you need, you have to be nice to someone who's made an honest mistake. You do not need to continue the conversation. Don't continue the conversation. Block it, delete it, whatever you need to do. But yeah, just uh, the, the, because the end game, and I think we talked about this with Thomas uh, Sanherjo a few weeks ago, is it's a pig butchering scam it's called. And we'll, we'll be talking about those again in a second where there, the eventual end game is to cultivate a relationship with you that ends in them scamming money out of you. It's a long, it's a longer term uh, scam. Uh, don't do it. Uh, then another one that I, I recently read about it actually in my, in the local paper here, be aware of, of sponsored results on Google searches. When you do a Google search at the top of the search, the first few search results are not organic. They are paid for to be at the top there. They're ads. Um, and there was this one story about a guy who wanted to buy tickets for uh, you know, the Boston Symphony Orchestra at Tanglewood this summer. And he went online, Googled it, Tanglewood BSO tickets, clicked on the first link. It looked really nice, said Tanglewood, all kinds of things. And he ended up paying 300 more dollars for his tickets than he should have because it doesn't sell out, Tanglewood says. Um, and uh, and it just turns out like it, it was a, a ticket reseller, one of these companies that when tickets go on sale, they buy up all, as many as they can and then resell them at a markup to unsuspecting people who don't realize that they don't have to buy it from this guy, that it's not the real tanglewood website with you know their box office and it's legal because there are disclaimers on the page this is not you know you know in small print uh that you'll scroll past quickly but you know it, it they're legal disclaimers so um yeah avoid i always avoid the sponsored ads at the top even if it's like for amazon or whatever because i just right. i figured they're gonna if i if i want a, the correct result it's not going to be an, someone who paid to be up there yeah, and uh, I got uh, several people hit by the driver's license renewal thing where they'd go and uh, look up driver's license renewal, go through, fill it all out, get all the way down, pay for it, you know, pay the fee. Only it was to a company that really all they did was provide you some material to help you through the process. And there were, are multiple sites out there that all pop to the top. When you're looking, you right. have to make sure it's for like Texas.gov or whatever dot org. Well, no, it'll be a gov, yeah. you know, for whatever your state is, because right. that's been real insidious. I've got s several people hit by that. Right. Yeah, you got to be aware. Go ahead. I said I had a coworker. He he did it and he I ended up doing it like multiple times because he kept thinking it wasn't going through. And yeah, oh. it, it, he was oh, pretty man. angry that day. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Once he figured it out. Yeah. And I had a, a client last week that uh, basically said she had, you know, five infected machines. And I said, well, tell me what's going on. Every time I try to go to Amazon, I get this, you know, this uh, bad result, you know, of something that uh, slams up and tells me I've got all these viruses, et cetera. Well, oh. what she was doing was just searching for Amazon and she was getting the bad sites. Mm. Actually, it was worse than that. She was doing Amazon.prime. Oh, 
Oh. Which is never going to be a right site. Yeah. So if you if you're going to a site, put the dot com in there and, you know, to get you to the site rather than searching for it. There are a lot of people, unfortunately, too many people who think that the search bar on Google is the address bar in the browser. That there's no difference. Like if you if you go to Google, you know, you open up your web browser and it defaults to a Google page, then they just type in where they want to go into the search. That's that's not safe, <laughs> as as you said, you know, that is that is not going to be a safe thing to do. Uh, I'm just looking for Amazon dot prime. Uh, see, when I do it, it does bring up the top results are all Amazon. So um, I'm wondering. Well, she was typing it into the address bar. Amazon. Oh, oh, okay. oh yeah. I have uh, noticed that the, there seem to be more sponsored links than there used to be. It used to be like two or three, and now it's like five to eight. Right. Um, sometimes it's like, uh, I have to go to the second page before I get to actual <laughs> results now. Thanks, Google. I appreciate <laughs> all the ad revenue you're making. <laughs> yeah. And although that's why I have... This, yep. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, although I have noticed in the last month, I'm seeing fewer uh, that are obvious uh, scammers that are popping up to the top. Uh, mm. I think Google is, had said that they were trying to revamp their their uh, search engine uh, to try to avoid some of this. Yeah, I, I can I can speak to that from the other side, because, we, you know, one of the charities, um, you know, my son's charity, we have an ad account with Google and they have really cracked down on the security side of the ball, like having to prove out who you are and what you're doing, and what your ads are for, reviewing your ads and that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, whereas before it was it very much felt like it was all kind of just automated. So if you knew, you know, what right. what the what the AI was looking for, you could trick it and put anything you want out there. Right. And sometimes they would uh, there was the ability to put up an ad and then swap it out, you know, and swap out the content of the ad after you've already had the ad approved and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, Bait and switch. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, one of the things you can do is uh, avoid Google altogether and use something like DuckDuckGo, which is another yep. search engine which doesn't do ads, um, or the Brave search engine, uh, which is uh, goes along with the Brave browser. So both of those are work workable. Start page also is a good one. It Start page actually gives you the Google results, but it doesn't pass to Google any of the identifying information. And so mm. it, it's, it, it stops the tracking, but you get the same Google results. Is that startpage.com? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, and then there's, of course, there's the, uh, my pick of the week from last time, perplexity.ai, which is the AI search engine, or they call it the answer engine, where um, it it creates an answer for you. It doesn't just give you a page of links. It puts it together for you um, and then gives you the sources footnoted for where it's getting that information from. So if you have questions, if you're not just like looking for a site, but if you have questions, uh, then it's the best way to go. Like what's the best uh, toaster oven? You know, it, it will give you an answer. Or I saw someone who's a woodworker, like what's the best hand planer? Uh, out there and it, it gave him like, he's like you know what it's not a bad answer like it gave it like three options like actually I, I think the second one that gave is the best one but the fact that it had th those three and then he then he like made a further niche special uh, specification of like a very specific thing that only a woodworker would know and it's like it came up with the exact answer that it should so uh, so perplexity.ai is i uh, being more and more uh impressed by it something to i you know encourage people to check out uh because mm -hmm. It's it's been pretty cool so far for me. I've used it for several different things. Um, I like what uh, uh, I had a problem with my Wi-Fi, and I was like, "Why are my devices connecting to Eero at just two point four gigahertz instead of five gigahertz?" And it gave me this whole long answer with some things I could check out, you know, troubleshooting techniques and stuff like that, and then links to other sites, including Eero's own site, but other sites like Reddit and whatever that had more information. So. <clears throat> Perplexity.ai is, is I still recommend it. Have to cool. check that out. Yeah. So uh, at this point, I think uh, we've pretty much covered uh, what we wanted to talk about with securing your uh, your your privacy, your your security while surfing. Uh, there is always more to say in the subject, and we will be revisiting it again in the future, whether reviewing or with new things we need to check out. 
if folks have questions or suggestions, we'd love to take those from you. You can email us at technology at sqpn.com or visit us on our Discord community, sqpn.com slash Discord, where we have a Secrets of Technology channel. So before we move on to our next segment, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the Secrets of Technology, including Jennifer S., Justin W., Kathleen F., Tom L., and Daniel D. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Technology and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. All right, it's time for our uh, headlines. And our first headline is an interesting one from Euronews.next. Headline says, uh, looking for an online article from 2013? It may have disappeared, new study says. Well, maybe I should put this on the Mysteri- Jimmy Eakin's Mysterious World. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> so what it is is a bit rot or digital decay or there's other terms. And so the Pew Research Center found that nearly 40 percent of all web pages. This is I think they, they word this a little confusingly it says that were created in 2013 are no longer accessible. But later on, they say a, about a. a uh, about 40% of all web pages that existed in 2013 are no longer accessible. So it's not that the ones that were created in that one year period, it's the internet as of it existed in 2013, 40% of, of that is gone, uh, which is a remarkable number when you think about it. Um, and then the, the article also talks about how there's a lot of also uh, link decay, which is, Bad links, which isn't doesn't mean that what they link to is gone, but the link has changed or the address has changed. And so that links are no longer valid. And it says that um, on Wikipedia, 54 percent of pages that they analyzed had at least one broken link in the references section, which is I don't think that's all that bad, I guess. I mean, it's, uh, it's just one broken link. Yeah. yeah. And then 23 uh, percent of news sites contained a broken link. Well, 21 percent of government pages did. And uh, of the government pages, the very worst were local governments, which I suppose that's not all that surprising. Yeah, Yeah. makes sense. Uh, Honestly, that's a pretty good record. (laughs) 20 (laughs) percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an issue. I I look at my own blog, which has been around for more than 20 years at this point. And a lot of the links to stuff on my blog will be broken because it's it's just. I haven't done a good job of maintaining it over the years and it's changed addresses and, and all kinds of, you know, I've, it's gone through three different types of uh, blog server software and, and all this sort of stuff. So I can, I get it. It's hard. It's hard to keep up with it. Um, but well, and especially after you've published something, you do, you can't control it. The other place is still existing. Right. Right. Well, that's, and so it's, I think it's more or less of a, what should we do as a person creating a website and linking to things to, what are we losing when we lose these web pages? And I mean, there's a lot of junk out there. Obviously there's a lot of, you know, stuff on the internet. Nobody needs to see ever again, but you know, there is something, (laughs) there is something about preserving valuable information. It's like, it's like a library going lost. You know, we've lost the whole library. Right. Or, or we've lost the archives of particular newspapers. They're just not there anymore. Yep. Those are the, some of the big ones. Yeah. I've, I've had the, you know, occasion to want to go back and look at old news articles, uh, for, for events in the past. And, and that's like, Oh, no longer there. That's gone. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I had, I was, I wrote for a website for a while. Um, for about a year and they went defunct at some point and I was like, I want to go find those old articles. Like I couldn't find them on the regular web. I ended up having to dig through the way back machine um, mm-hmm. and put it in there and dig through. The, and I found, I found my stuff. I was super happy. I was like, damn, and copying <laughs> all the word documents and saving it. <laughs> well, um, but yeah, I had that same experience with my own blog where I've lost stuff off of my own website and I had to use the way back machine to find it. Uh, you know, because parts of the, the blog has gone away. There is a related problem, too, which is that a lot of these URL shorteners that we've been using for years, especially with social media, they end up, you know, some of them go under, some of them go defunct. I had this dumb idea for a while where I had a personalized bit uh, um, 
URL, URL shortener, bet.to, B-E-T-T dot T-O. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. I have my very own, except uh, I got tired of paying for that domain and stopped. And I re- now all of those links are, are, are dead links. They're, they don't work. They don't go anywhere anymore. Uh, it, you know, it's like defunct. So um, it's an issue with we need to, I think as a, as a tech society, we need to think about this, about preserving our history and what are we losing? I think I think we have not, as a as a group, been as systematic about preserving some of this as we should be. We should be a little more concerned, I think, about losing information out there. It's so easy to get caught up in the fact that there's so much on the internet now, but what are we losing? That's that's what I can. I mean, uh, there are plenty of live journal sites maybe that we don't need, but you know, <laughs> other than that. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've seen, known some people with really good live journal yeah. accounts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To some, I think some people probably would prefer that their live journal accounts go missing. But the, yeah. Um, so. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's it's not just uh, internet websites. It's it like photos. A whole bit about we don't print photos anymore, and the next mm-hmm. generations are not going to have the photos because there's too many that get lost when somebody dies. Well, and they've never been printed. Yes. And they're gone. They're in somebody's cloud that's locked away and they they can't be accessed. They're not in a bin in Grandma's attic, you know, like right. it was for with, me. With handwritten notes on the back. Yeah. 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 Well, if you're that's, lucky. <laughs> yeah. And that goes into like a related issue, which is, um, you know, at some point, it, Facebook right now has a policy of maintaining people's, deceased people's uh, accounts. But they're it's not an under option. right. They're not under yeah. obligation to do that. And um, at some point, there's going to be more. Uh, there's going to be fewer living users than there are deceased users. And then the question mark becomes: Well, what are they going to do with all of the the data? Just are kill they, it? Are they going to kill it? And yeah. you think about all the because. I mean, for a while there, that was one of the primary photographic media <laughs> was was that, and then Instagram. But they also own Instagram. It's the same right. the same problem on there. So that is a well, that is you, a real big question. You can question go mark. download all your photos and everything off of Facebook. You can go and and, and ask for that to be done. But you, to you do know, it. not remove them, but but it just say I want to export them out. Right, and you can get them that way. But um, what if you yeah, can get that for if for like your your deceased loved Only ones. Only if you have been uh, pre pre authorized as the uh, the mm-hmm. art. Uh, what what is it? Executor? There's a term for it. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, not ex- exactly an executor. Legacy. If you've oh, been right. pre authorized as the legacy owner, you know that you can make decisions for that account. So that do be like part of your will. <laughs> yes. Did you write that uh, in? Me, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we I actually have lawyers that they're looking at elder care and these issues, you know, yeah. because uh, and and trying to make sure that families can get a hold of them, because most of these companies know if you're not the owner and you had not preset who you wanted to be your archive recipient, then it's you you don't have rights to it. Yeah. We actually did an episode on that topic um, uh, a while ago now, uh, so we, we could revisit that at some point. But just the idea of, you know, what happens when you die, you know, what happens to your data and your technology and, and the people who have to deal with it after you're gone. And how can we help make that easier? And maybe how can tech companies make the whole thing a little easier as well? Um, but uh, we sh- there's been developments in this area. You know, companies like Apple and Google, because our phones are such an important part of our digital life, they uh, they are doing more and more in this area to, to help. So uh, something to something to think about there. Uh, our next headline is oh, speaking of tech companies trying to help is from Engadget. Uh, the headline is Match Group, Meta, Coinbase and more form anti-scam coalition. Uh, so this is a coalition of, of companies. Uh, Match Group, if you don't know, is they own the the oh, quote unquote dating websites, uh, apps, uh, Tinder, Hinge, stuff like that. Uh, I dating in. Quotes. Air quotes. <laughs> yeah. air, air quotes. Air yeah. quotes. Uh, but anyway, they what they're doing is they're they're banding together to identify scams and like we were talking about before, some of these scams that uh, that people are, are running on, on on folks uh, to kind of get a best practice. 
to to get a better, a fuller picture of this because a lot of times the scammers will work across apps. They'll take you from one app to another. They'll they'll meet you on Facebook and try to get you to uh, well, WhatsApp is also one by Facebook, but you know what I mean. Like they they want to get you eventually over to Coinbase where your cryptocurrency is, so they can enter your your uh, crypto wallet. You know they want to work together to prevent these problems, and it's interesting to think about how you know. If Facebook has got a sort of narrow uh, look at the tech space, the social media, uh, whereas, you know, crypto uh, Coinbase has a different look at the tech space. Uh, and so they may not have a full understanding of the issues of scamming for the other guy. So by by coming together, I, I think it helps. I like this. I think it's I think it's a way it, this is an area where government doesn't have to step in and create a government agency. It's these companies working in their best interest and our best interest to kind of stop the scammers together. Um, what do you all think of this? Uh, I think it would be really helpful because right now it's been a problem. You know, you see something, it's an obvious a scam or an obvious uh, wrong site and you know, you report it and it says, I'm sorry, we don't see anything wrong with this particular thing. Right. Uh, and so, or you report somebody who's pretending to be somebody else and you know, yeah, they take it down for a couple of days and it's back again. Yep. So it, I would really like to see some, some emphasis by these companies. Yeah. One of the things they mentioned in the article is that their major focus is on something we've been talking about, pig butchering scams, which is the type of fraud where the scammer tricks you into a relationship, whether it's romantic or platonic, and eventually, you know, builds this trust so that you will eventually give them your money and, and, you know, so it's it's interesting to see how the scammers have gone from the quick. Let's just you know get a bit out of people who are quickly uh, tricked uh, to the long con and and developing these relationships. Uh, but they're they're working on you know because these pig butchering scams usually take you across several different websites. That's one of the reasons why they're focusing on that. That's yeah, one of the things that's come up recently is I'm seeing a lot more things on social media about, you know, the forever stamp is going uh, to be raising prices here. Come come uh, buy them bef at a lower cost before they go up. And that's not the case. I mean, that you can't go get half price stamps. Uh, right. you, it, and there's a lot of these fake sites out there and, and they're preying on people's fear that they're going to all of a sudden be having to pay a lot more. And so. Mm -hmm. I've tried to report a few of those and they say, no, I'm sorry. There's, you know, this is a legitimate business. They don't actually say that, but right. Yeah. You know. I think it's, I think it's really smart because it, I've seen it. I've seen industries um, try to turn blind eyes to things and then, you know, whatever space they're in, the regulator will come down. The regulator slash public will come down on, on them, you know, like a Thor's hammer. Um, and then I've seen mm -hmm. other industries, uh, the bulk electricity industry, so forming FERC and NERC, and the nuclear industry forming INPO, Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, where they were like, no, no, like, we have to do this right, otherwise the public will, you know, pitchfork us to death. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of the tech companies are starting to see the writing on the wall with the con kind of continuous summons to Congress and the the them being dragged up and now kind of both sides of the aisle kind of decrying the various problems we yeah. have. I think they're like, okay, well we actually need to step up and, and we need, we need to give the public what they want. <laughs> right. Otherwise they're going to take it. <laughs> clean your own house or they'll, we'll clean the house for you. Yeah. Yep. Um, so our last headline is uh, Mike, about Microsoft from Ars Technica. Microsoft says, Prism translation layer does for ARM PCs what Rosetta did for Macs. So uh, Microsoft introduced some new all ARM, uh, ARM powered uh, Surface PCs, uh, you know, laptops and PCs, um, convert, Surface Pro convertible, Surface laptop, uh, running the ARM processor instead of Intel. And uh, they've had ARM processors before, but they're heading more in the ARM direction, uh, sort of like Apple did. Uh, but what they need to do like Apple needed to do was provide a way for people to keep using the software that ran on the old Intel chips to run on the new arm chips. Uh, so Apple has Rosetta, which is a translation layer and Microsoft has prism, which is, it's really just a new version of a technology they've had for a bit. 
uh, in Windows 11, but it's better now, apparently. Faster. Uh, <laughs> yeah, faster, which is the key. Um, they claim that it, uh, you know, it makes makes it just as fast as the Max, uh, M, you know, the, the M series Max uh, running the software. You know, we'll see the, the independent benchmarks and whatnot. But um, what do y'all think uh, of the Microsoft ARM transition and these translation layers? Well, what, one of the things that I didn't realize is that the reason they're heading to ARM is because they're trying to build in Copilot and all the AI stuff into the computer themselves. And they can't do it with the Intel stuff as easily. So that's why they're headed to ARM, because I was kind of confused. Why are they doing this? And that's it was not just that they're wanting a smaller, faster machine. It's that they want to include all of this stuff on the board, on the mm-hmm. on the processor itself. Yeah, Intel has really fallen behind uh you know, versus NVIDIA and AMD, they're getting their, they're just getting their clock cleaned uh, because, you know, they, they just cannot compete with any of this stuff, especially the neural processing stuff, the, all the AI stuff, which is now the hot thing. Uh, so, yeah. Um, although uh, it is funny, Microsoft is putting a copilot key on the keyboard I'm like <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> Microsoft has this habit of like, well, let's let's have a key for it. The keyboard is like the most sacrosanct space. It should be the hardest thing possible to put a new key on a keyboard because people use keyboards without looking. I, how I just can't imagine that people <laughs> want to use Copilot so much that they need a dedicated key on the keyboard. They could We're, put another button somewhere else on the computer that you could push, not right. not on the keyboard itself. <laughs> yeah, or just say, hey, Dingus, you know, hey, Copilot, you know, like we do with the other stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't like talking to, my, to that stuff either, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So that'll be interesting to see that roll out and uh, where that goes with Windows. And uh, I'd like to hear from folks who have a chance to try it out and see what, the, what they think. So uh, that's it for our headlines. Let's move on to our picks of the week. Pat, you are first. What is your pick this week? Well, I had an occasion recently to work on a machine that uh, was a really nice machine, had a lot of memory, a lot of processor, but it ran really hot. And so I went back to my old days of looking for a laptop cooler and uh, I found a really nice one and it did a really good job. And since then, I've had a couple of other people say, my machine's just running hot. I think maybe they're pushing out machines with with too much uh, processor power for the for the size of the engine, so to speak. But at any rate, I found a really nice one and there's a bunch of different brands. But so my pick is is the uh, particular um uh Q-tech. And I don't have that up and yeah, yeah I'm sorry the Kutech laptop cooling pad for it's about 25 bucks on Amazon so yeah and there's some a lot of other ones out there too this was just the one I bought and it yeah. it was really nice cuz it had a bunch of fans and and things that you could use the USB as a pass through and uh for power and other things so yeah I thought it was pretty good a couple of things you want to look at when you're looking for one is how loud it might be you know, you don't yeah. want missing that's really loud. Um, you know, some people, they have a sensitive to, to the noise, uh, but also the connections, like what kind of, how is it powered? Is it USB-C, USB-A? And, you know, take a look at that and make sure it works for you, uh, the, the types of connections it uses. Yeah, and this one had a height adjustment type of thing where you could, you know, get your laptop tilted up that way if, if you wanted to do that. Nice. Um, as well as... Um, Basically, as I say, they had uh, several USB power uh, pass throughs that I thought were really helpful. If you know someone who works with their laptop on their lap all the time or on a bed or, you know, on a Mm. soft surface that's terrible for the machine, get one of these at least to help alleviate some of that and and get some of the air out. Even this might not work perfectly if you have someone who wants to put it on a quilt where it sinks in. Oh, I, know. I, I have someone in my I life who does teenagers that. Teenagers that did, yeah. <laughs> I think it might be the same person. <laughs> well, no, I'm thinking of of, of younger clients that, uh, oh, yeah, they're, they're <laughs> not family. <laughs> not <laughs> but yes, I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that, that may work as well. Uh, Patrick, I know it's your first time. Did you have a pick for us this week or? So I, I do. Um, so given the the month I have been in like full blown prep mode for my pool, getting it ready. And we finally swam in it last week. So, um, but of the many things I've bought, 
One of them that I really enjoyed is a robotic pool cleaner. And it Mm -hmm. doesn't get a lot of the big stuff, but what it does is it keeps kind of the, and we have a lot of uh, trees in and around our pool. And so we get a lot of leaves Um, in the fall. It's absolutely terrible. But (laughs) at this time of year, it's kind of a regular set, but having one of these cleaners kind of picks it up as it goes. And unlike a lot of the pool equipment, which sort of brings itself into your pool pump and filter equipment and you kind of have those large hoses and it um it ends up all on your filter and you end up having to dump your filter and clean it more often these are kind of autonomous um so you know it runs its thing you go you hook it in the morning you drag it out you pull the filter out you clean it off you let it dry you plug it back in and then you you run it again at night um the brand i'm using is iper which is spelled like Viper, but you replace the V with an A because they were clever. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they upside down the V. Oh. Um, but there's several brands out there, and uh, but I, I really like it. I, I like how how it works, and um, you know, on a on a dark night, you can watch it roving around the pool underwater. <laughs> it's just got a little light, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. I will. Uh, they will have a link in the show notes to the uh, Iper store on Amazon, and they will have a. <laughs> you can you can see all the different ones that they have there. Uh, excellent. So my pick this week is an app, and uh, it's available for. Um, oh, that's interesting. It's not available as I just. I'm being told oh. I can't connect to the app store. Silly, silly. <laughs> well, thank, thanks, yeah. Apple, for giving me hassles in the middle of my show (laughs) doing maintenance in the middle of your work (laughs) or something uh so i will uh, actually look at it on my iphone because it's available on ipad ios and mac uh although (laughs) the on mac to be determined uh, in the future but it's called (laughs) elsewhen we'll get to the i'll get to the actual pick um it it's a sort of specialized little app it's about time and especially if you have to deal with multiple time zones all the time uh i'm going to use time a lot in this so just be prepared for that redundancy. Uh, I have to deal with a lot of time zones because I have people all the way, you know, I've got people in Britain all the way to Australia who do podcasts with me. So it's, you know, the, the time zones are a thing. So it started as a very simple app for people who use Discord a lot where you wanted mm. to put a time on Discord. And what time is it? What time zone? You have to specify, oh, it's, you know, a 9 a.m. Eastern time or whatever. Well, this one where you can go in and select tell it a t- into elsewhere put type in a date and time and it will create a special time code that discord understands so that when you paste it into discord in a message it translates it to whatever the time zone is for the person who's viewing it at that moment oh, so wow. it, mm. if you're in central time zone it will show you the time in your time in central time but in, if, if i if i'm looking at it showing it in eastern time zone it's expanded beyond that to to help you convert times into all different formats uh to to keep track of different time zones um to, if you if you um if you do zoom calls for instance with people across a, a, a bunch of different time zones and the same time zones all the time uh you know whether it's uh you know so you got one person in england one person in east coast one person on the west coast and one person in japan you can create a customized list so that all you have to do is say uh tell you know give me the list of the the correct time for a zoom meeting like you could do this and paste into a message our meeting is going to be at these this time and it will show like the flag and the time zone and the time for that for, for for all of the different ones uh and you could create you know a list that's standardized for your particular needs. Hmm. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to describe on the on the you know over the podcast, but uh, I would encourage folks to check it out if you if it sounds like something that you may need. Uh, I mean, if you if you deal with multiple time zones, this might be a, a, a good handy tool to use. Um, you know, I like I'm thinking of using this for when I just you know, trying to schedule a podcast recording. I could just paste into the Slack message. We're going to record at this. I mean. Ours are almost always at 9 p.m. Eastern because it seems to work. But if we had a different time, I would put in, you know, we're going to record at 4 p.m. Eastern. Here's what it is where you are, you know, just <laughs> and just have the, the thing figured out for me. 
Uh, so oh, that'll help me with my my VR uh, mini golf uh, matches that I'm doing. <laughs> yes, right. Because you're, you're, I, I play with people from Britain, from Australia, yeah, from all over the world, Canada. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so you know what time it is for them. Uh, so those are our picks of the week, and that's it from us this time. We would like to hear from you. What did you think of any part of our discussion? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash technology, the StarQuest Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. Send an email to technology at sqpn.com. Visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You'll find links from our discussion and our picks of the week on our show notes at starquest.com. Dot fm slash tec258 that's the show number te tech 258 follow the secrets of tech in apple Podcasts, spotify tune in your favorite podcast app or at our youtube channel where you should hit the bell uh, to get notifications we're at youtube.com slash starquest media until next time patrick mason thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology uh you're very welcome great being here thank you pat scott thank you as well Oh, it was good as usual. Thank you. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. <laughs>